Tom McLaughlin is here. Uh, he's a man of many talents. He's a mime. He's directed some really cool gothic horror films such as One Dark Night and Friday the 13th Part 6, Jason Lives. Uh, he also is in a, a band called The Sloths. Really good band. Download the music and album off of Apple Music or I think they're on Amazon Music. What's another? Is it Google Music? Um, no, that's YouTube Music now. I think you can get both. YouTube Music. Listen to his music. It's actually really cool. Good rock and roll, man. So check him out on there. He also is the subject and co-writer of this book. He kind of This is edited by Joseph Madry, but it is Tom's book. It's called A Strange Idea of Entertainment. It's a conversation with Tom McLaughlin. Covers his whole history, his whole life story. And, uh, you know, one, it's an easy read. I read through it in literally a day. It's so good, you don't want to put it down. And there's some really good tips, not only just about Tom, but if you want to work in the creative field. So pick up this book. You can get it on Amazon. Uh, it's worth having. And uh, check it out. So without further ado, here he is, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Tom McLaughlin. Tom? Tom, can you hear me? Uh, this is not good. Tom, can you hear me? Tom. Thomas. All right, all right. I don't know, guys. Hey, is that better? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Bad old mind trick. Sorry, had to do it. Used to get paid a good salary to do that kind of shit. Now you can't, you can only do that in Central Park, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Just got to throw it in when I can. I used to do that when I was directing. You know, I'd be standing over in a corner and people, were, you know, they're always looking at the director for, you know, something, <laughs> information, what's going on, something. And I'd be over in a corner doing a robot or, you know, you know, pulling an invisible rope or something. I was like, I don't know about this guy. So, but, you know, it's definitely, definitely a way to show off what took me, you know, years of training to get to do. Your, your father, uh, he was into, uh, he went to a film school, and, and how, did he help you when you were making your own 8 millimeter films? Yeah, I mean, uh, probably people have heard this a million times, but yeah, my, my dad went to USC film school, and when he graduated, there was no place for, a, you know, a student filmmaker, although he was 40 years old at that point because he'd gone through the war, and, you know, he was trying to find a career. Um, so I basically got his 16 millimeter equipment. Um, and, you know, he, you know, taught me how to use it, but it was just too expensive and too overwhelming. So, you know, I got an eight millimeter camera and then started to shoot in the back lots of MGM because we were right next door to that. And I would show him stuff and, you know, he would, you know, he would, you know, be critical, you know, not critical, but he would, you know, give me notes and things about it. Um, and so many times <laughs> when you make these movies in those days and you shot, you know, in these little tiny reels, and then you had to send it off to Kodak in Chicago to do the developing. And then hopefully it came back. Sometimes some of the reels did, sometimes it didn't. So I had a lot of, you know, half or, you know, it got the end of the movie, but somehow they lost the beginning. So it was kind of a, a mishmash. I think I only got a few that I actually have the whole thing. Uh, and God knows where those are today. You, you got to find those and put those on some sort of a special feature on something. Yeah, I'd love, I'd love somebody uh -huh. to track those down. I, no idea uh, where they disappear. It's like the Sloss song, you know, Making Love. Nobody had any idea that that became a cult hit till like 45 years later. You know, then you find out, oh, somebody knows that song? What do you mean? It's actually like popular? So, I mean, it was, you know, the whole reason the band got back together again was because we had no idea if somebody found that lost thing in some garage sale or something. So let me let me ask you. Uh, so you mentioned the sloths. You you when you were sixteen, you were you in a band? Oh yeah, I started. I guess maybe fourteen. I mean, like when the Beatles hit, every dude had to grow his hair out. You know, I mean, it's the only way to get a girl. You know, you, it's like if you look like you know a, a you know a soph or a jock or and forget about it. But if you look like an English rock rock and roller, you know you could go and play somewhere and girls would come and scream. They all got into it and stuff. So it was like the go-to thing as a teenager, just by some incredible coincidence that, you know, we were all on the Sunset Strip. So we were opening for the doors, Iron Butterfly, The Animals, Love, Pink, 
Pink Floyd. I mean, and you were like, we were like 15, 16 years old. So it was an amazing time to be in rock and roll. And we basically were doing covers of Rolling Stone songs and, and that, you know, that stuff. And then kind of writing our own stuff. But um, yeah, I mean, we were just kind of young and crazy. And, you know, I went to Monterey Pop and I was friends with Henry Mancini's son, Chris. So we sat in the front row to see Hendrix for the first time, Otis Redding, Janis Joplin, all these people. And if you watch the documentary, Monterey Pop, you can see me like this. I mean, I was just stoned and mind blown, you know, by that. And that was the thing that really kind of cemented that I got to be a rock and roller. I got to do this. But you, you put that on hold to become a, a film director. Well, I wouldn't say I put it on hold. <laughs> kind of what happened was, this is what leads into the mind thing, is, you know, I wanted to do something that Mick Jagger, Roger Daltrey, James Brown, all these guys that I idolized, wasn't doing. And that was to try to sort of physically um, act out, you know, during the bridges of the song, you know, some act, some, you know, part of the story of the song. And that kind of led me into this idea of pantomime. I didn't really know anything about it. I never even heard the word mime. And then the famous French mime, Marcel Marceau, came to Los Angeles. I went and saw his show and I kind of was like, yeah, it's not me. I'm not gonna put stuff on my face and stuff. But I went back afterwards, introduced myself, kind of showed him the sort of stuff I learned how to do. And then he said, well, why don't you come to Paris? Bring lots of money, I have a school. So I went, okay. <laughs> You know, left my girlfriend, left the band, left my, you know, family and went to Paris, not speaking one word of French at, at 19. And I kind of did the starving artist in Paris for a year, uh, you know, hang out, hung out on Jim Morrison's grave on Sundays, you know, watched people singing the songs. I mean, it was a really strange period, but, a, you know, very, very much a life changer for me. Um, so it was really to try to be a better lead singer and performer. But... I realized I actually could do comedy. I actually had a ability, which I don't know where it came from, maybe my father showing me Charlie Chaplin movies, you know, uh, that he had, you know, 16 millimeter prints of, uh, but it was sort of inherent. So I started, you know, performing, you know, silent comedy. And one thing led to another and I got a call and it's like, uh, Woody Allen would like to meet you. I'm like, what, Woody, why? And it's like, well, he's doing this movie called Sleeper. They want to do robots. He needs somebody to work with him to do, you know, a robot. So that was like my, you know, first gig into the Screen Actors Guild, um, you know, playing one of the robots in there, working with Woody, which was, of course, amazing. And then it just kind of took off from there where I was offered all these sort of jobs that required the skills of a mime, <laughs> like inside the Jabberwocky costume for Alice, uh, Alice in Wonderland, the TV uh, miniseries. Uh, Captain Star in the Black Hole, um, the Mutated Bear in Prophecy. I mean, all this crazy shit, which paid the bills and I could write scripts, um, you know, while I was sitting around waiting for the shots. And it kind of gave me a sense of, uh, okay, I really want to write and direct, but, you know, these acting things give me a chance to at least, you know, make a living. So, and then obviously, it, you know, slowly transitioned into when I got One Dark Night made. And then it was kind of, you know, all right, now, you know, I'm a writer-director. Now, before we jump into One Dark Night, I do want to ask a question. Now, while you were in Paris, you went to the catacombs. Yes, sir. Good research. And, and that's something I've always wanted to do. How was it? It's not as cool as it was then, because um, I went back recently. I had a, I had a film um, over there, and I was working with somebody on, on their stage show. So I went to the catacombs again. And it was, you know, very different. The whole thing was lit up, you know, they, you know, lights, you work, you know, went with a group. But when I went, you know, uh, you know, back in 1970, you know, you went down there and there was only a few people and you had a, a, a little candle and that was it. So as, you know, everybody walked, I decided, you know, Mr. Edgar Allan Poe here, I was going to drop back from the crowd and be by myself and kind of walk around. Well, I didn't realize it that <laughs> that was my first encounter with what I call supernatural fear, where there's like nobody, you know, there, there's nothing, you know, nobody's chasing you with a knife or anything, but you just start looking at these walls that are nothing but skulls and bones from 
hundreds of years and all these cemeteries that were dug up and all the you know bones and shit put down there i just started to get that chill up the up the, the back you know your spine and into your head and i was going i got to get up with the group i got to catch up i got to get <laughs> and that obviously that impression is what sort of motivated that idea of you know spending the night in a place where there's the dead so i just kind of translated that idea into um, a mausoleum and then that's you know where one dark night came from now did you ever see there's a video this is infamous video that goes around the internet of a, a guy who went down to the catacombs i think in the 90s or early 2000s and he he disappeared did you ever see that video no I, it's it's still there I, yeah, I mean, I can, I'll send it to you after this interview, but it's a, it's a pretty, whether it's fake or not, it's a cool little idea for a film. Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> Wish I would have thought of it. <laughs> oh, man. So, all right, so let's jump into One Dark Night. Now, this is a flick that I really enjoyed as a kid because it just, like, the first, how you did it, like, the first half of the movie is just, you know, you get to know the characters, who they are, what their plans are, and then the last, yeah, exactly. And it was true to how kids are, you know? They're assholes, you know? Um, but the, the, the last 20 minutes, it's just frightening, especially... And this is something I want to mention. I don't know. I'm sure you were going for something more for adults, but this is a good gateway film for kids to get into the genre, in my opinion. I mean, back then, I'm sure it, it scared adults as much as... I mean, even to this day, it's, it's a freaky idea. It's some deep stuff, especially when you're listening... Uh, when when the, the, the wife of uh, um, Adam West is listening to those tapes, the things that this guy did. Is his name Raymar? Yeah, that, that scared me, just listening to those tapes. And I, that was brilliant how you did that. Thanks. Um, well, you know what? It was a time when my influences were those um, kind of low-budget horror movies, which when I look at them today, I was I think, you know, how was I sitting through this shit when I was eight years old? There, it's so much talking and exposition. Um, I just watched for the first time in, I don't know how many decades, The Mad Magician last night, uh, and it was like some obscure uh, app. Uh, I can't even remember the name of the thing, but, it, you know, horrible print um, of it. You can barely make it out, but I remembered as a kid, I really loved that because I adored Vincent Price. I mean, he was my hero. So anything he was in, I saw. But what, again, every time I see these, I see there was so much talking. And then there's like two or three, maybe four, like cool sequences that I really remembered. So somehow, you know, you would sit through all that stuff and wait for this, you know, the great scenes to happen. So when I made One Dark Night, all of that influence, I think, was still there where, you know, you set up with this sort of weird premise. Now, originally, in my cut, you know, the, the movie starts with the corner wagons because that was this, you know, idea I had of seeing one corner wagon, then another, then another, then another. And you go, what the fuck is going on here? And, you know, then that whole introduction of Raymar and the, the, the electricity coming out of his hand and stuff. Well, when the film was, the company was taken over by this guy, uh, Chuck Sellier, uh, who went on to make uh, uh, Silent Night, Deadly Night, um, he decided that, you know, he wanted to recut the movie and add some stuff and things, which, of course, was, you know, horrible for, for me and my cause, who I did the film with. But, you know, it, it, it didn't destroy it. It just changed some stuff. But still, you know, when I started watching the movie with an audience, I real, realized that, you know, we had them at the beginning, and then all the talk, you really had to kind of pay attention, and then the end really took off. But we fully believed that we were going to get an R rating for the amount of, you know, maggots and pus and corpses and all this shit. We had no idea that the motion picture rating board was going to go. Now, this is good. This is a this is a good, scary thing. There's no blood. There's no tits. You know, nothing to offend anybody. PG. And we're like, no, 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 no. We don't want a PG. <laughs> you know, it sounds like it's going to be like a you know baby movie or something. So we kind of went in with this attitude. It's like, ah, shit, you know, we really wanted this to be a little more edgy. But what happened was, you know, kids saw, hey, dad, it's PG. Hey, grandma, can you take me to this movie? So PG. So all these kids that were like seven, eight, nine years old were seeing this thing and, you know, getting the shit scared out of them. But a lot of those people, probably like yourself, you know, are now in the industry today and they go, God, I loved that when I was a kid. That was just, you know... It just sort of appeals to that basic 
horror, you know, idea of being locked in some place, claustrophobic. Meg Tilly, to me, was a very identifiable character, which is why I liked her. You know, she was sort of the, you know, the every girl, which was, you know, pretty standard. But instead of doing, you know, the blue-eyed blonde, I, you know, went for a look that was not what you normally would expect. And she was a great actress, which she obviously went on to prove when she was up for an Oscar for Agnes of God. But um, I just wanted it to be something that kind of was a homage to those films that I grew up with loving. Now, the flip side of that is we went to this horror film festival with the movie, um, I guess it was in 83. And the first night I went to the film festival, Sam Raimi was there with this movie that he made called Evil Dead. And the crowd went fucking apeshit. I mean, they were chanting in French, blood, 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 blood. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm fucked <laughs> because I don't have a drop. I ain't got no tits. I ain't got any of this stuff. And I was going to be on the next night. And Sam and I became friends you know, from that because he, all those guys that worked on that thing were just amazing guys. Um, but, you know, I go on the next night and, of course, nowhere near the same kind of res response. You know, they really enjoyed it. And in the end, they cheered and went on and stuff. But I was thinking, boy, I'm really behind the times now. You know, Sam has jumped in and, you know, started kind of a whole new thing. Um, just like Dan Merritt did with the, uh, you know, Blair Witch, you know, it was, a, it was coming in and it was something we hadn't seen before. And that's obviously really important for those of you guys that were filmmakers is trying to find something old, but spruce it up in a way that it looks like, you know, we hadn't seen this before. But One Dark Night, I really wanted to get that gothic horror, you know, corpses and all the rest of that. So uh, in the last few years, I've been writing a... It's a sort of, it's a re-envisioning of the movie, but it's also a prequel. So it literally, the first act starts with Raymar so that you actually see what he does, you know, how he does it, how he drains these girls. He's searching for his daughter uh, in Los Angeles. She knows nothing about him. And the end of act one is his death. Um, then, you know, we've, I, I've just kind of shifted it so that, uh, Raymar's daughter is actually like a psychologist school counselor and at a junior high where the girls go to school. So she ha has to constantly get in the middle of, you know, Carol and her gang, you know, teasing uh, the Meg Telly character, but they're all junior high. So they're, you know, younger, but these girls are much meaner, you know, in terms of, you know, what they do. And of course, the last thing is putting them in this place that Olivia is aware of because it's her father. And then, you know, I'm going to try to do, obviously, effects and things that we weren't able to do back then um, and just try to improve the movie overall. I don't want to fuck it up for the fans who love the funkiness you know, of the, that 80s movie. But at the same time, I just there's that frustration after 42 movies. I feel like I can go back and make that better. So I don't know if I'll get the chance. I mean, I've, I've got the script almost done and I know who owns the rights to the thing now. So we'll see what happens. What 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 was the shoot itself like? Like when I look at the movie, it it seemed like it had a very like well for one it looked like you were, it's the closest movie other than a Tim Burton movie that feels like a Mario Bava film, just by the look of Raymar and you know kind of there was some Black Sabbath going on there if you ask me some of the makeup and stuff it looked really cool. But what was the shoot itself like? Did you get any? Uh, were you claustrophobic in that mausoleum? You know was a Anybody else kind of freaked out shooting in there? Make Tilly was. Uh, there was no question. Make Tilly was such an, an 19. She was so um, common sense wise. She was brought up, both her and her sister Jennifer, you know, grew up in Canada. They had basically no television and they weren't taken to the movies. Their parents really made them use their imaginations and write and storytell and stuff. So she was a very different you know, late teenager than I'd ever met before. So when she got into this, you know, situation, she just used all of her sensitivity. So, you know, anytime there was a noise in that mausoleum, she'd like, what was that? And I remember at one point, one of those um, things that you move the flowers with, those poles that, that, that fall over, I think we made use of it in the movie, uh, somebody banged into one and it hit the ground and made this huge bang and echo. I mean, she literally jumped into my arms it scared her so much. So she was definitely, you know, all wired in to make that work. Um, 
you know, most of it was, you know, a set that we built, the Craig Stearns did and did an amazing job, you know, all the stuff where the, the bodies come out and stuff obviously had to be a set. And then we used, you know, the Hollywood uh, Cemetery, which is now Hollywood Forever, you know, to shoot all those incredible long shots. I was trying to make it look sort of like modern, almost like alien in terms of it being very cold and sterile. And yet behind those marble walls were these, you know, rotted corpses. I never really thought about the Italian horror movies. I mean, I'd seen them, of course, um, but I was just trying to, you know, fly on my own instincts of what, you know, I thought from an Edgar Allan Poe background, you know, could be cool. And then trying to put as much of the, you know, oh my God, that's gross, like with the, the pus pushing against Carol's face from up the corpse and the, you know, the maggots and all that stuff that, you know, I felt like people hadn't seen. So it, it was really a, a combination of, you know, setting an environment that was, you know, really a place where I hadn't seen anything done. The closest thing, obviously, was the, um, uh, oh, God, I just went right out of my head. The, um, <laughs> with the spear and the, with the, the ball and the, uh, the pointed thing. Why can't I think of it? Coscarelli's movie. Oh, Phantasm. Yes. Some, you know, Sunday morning, you know, not enough coffee. Sorry, guys. Um, but yeah, I mean, he had like a small mausoleum in that. You know, we were already off and rolling with this thing. And it was kind of like, uh, uh oh, but, you know, very, very different approach to it than obviously what, what we were trying to do. Uh, we called it Mausoleum. Uh, somebody came out with that movie in the title. So we had to lose that. We shot it under the title Rest in Peace and uh, which we didn't care for. And then. You know, suddenly one day I hear, oh, now it's called One Dark Night, which I hated. I just thought it just, now that really sounds like a kid's book, you know, One Dark Night. Um, but, you know, it's come, you know, all these years, it's kind of become this, oh, yeah, did you ever see that little thing? Yeah, yeah, I saw it when I was a kid. And I figured, you know, you never know where your shit's going to end up. Uh, it, it's just like I, I made a movie years later with Molly Ringwall, um, called the Allison Gert story about the first woman who came, you know, came out uh, and said she was going to fight AIDS because she got it from a bartender at, uh, in New York. And, you know, we did this thing and it was really kind of a, a message about safe sex early on, but mainly it was a message that, you know, hello, if you're a female, you can still get AIDS. It's not just a gay disease. And that was a big thing. And so when the movie came out, it was, you know, fairly controversial. You know, we, had a scene where literally uh, Molly Ringwald was putting a rubber on a guy, you know, of course off camera, but you know, you heard it and stuff, all of that stuff for ABC television was like a big deal. But the amazing thing is, you know, years later, that thing kind of was shown in high schools as sex education movie, you know, to give like a background of what happened to this girl because she wasn't practicing safe sex. Who the hell ever thought something like that was going to happen? And we won an award from something in Washington, some health department award and things. And to me, we were making a movie about, you know, a woman who contracted AIDS and all the shit she had to go through, all the loss of her boyfriend, loss of friends, all that stuff. So my point is, you just never know where your work is going to end up. Um, it, you know, you do some. I never thought Friday the 13th was going to be anything other than something that was going to come out and be gone and be forgotten about come, you know, 1987. And here we are 34 years later. It's honest to God, bigger than it's ever been much to my shock. I, I, I you know, just, I, I still can't believe it when you get all these, you know, people calling for podcasts and fan letters and things for something, you know, that long ago, but it like Frankenstein, Dracula, Wolfman, it just somehow became, you know, the monsters of the 80s, which was a special period that most of you guys saw on, you know, VHS or, you know, or on, you know, TV uh, stations that was cut down, um, you know, the, the gore factor and stuff. But it's become, you know, definitely, you know, part of each generation now, which is cool. And I'm certainly, you know, happy for that because it, you know, makes makes me feel like, you know, you made something that people still love after all these years. It, it's definitely because that was my first like kind of foray into the Tom McLaughlin as a director. I saw fr the Friday the Thirteenth movie, um, but that kind of opened up like you know I was a kid when I saw that and I was like, well, what else has this guy done? And you know back then we had video stores, so I would go around looking, and that's how I found One Dark Night. 
So, you know, it's, it's kind of, to me, it's interesting how, you know, when I said uh, the whole Mario Baba feel and look to it, I think I meant more like it felt like an Italian horror film near the end, but you had your own style to it. It was cleaner and a little bit glossier than most movies. And I didn't even think about the alien type of thing because when you watch One Dark Night, it is very clean until the last couple minutes. And that's when the whole, you know, the grossness comes out. Yeah. Well, I, I, you know, I met a lot of DPs for it, and I ended up choosing a guy who had done Bachelor Party, you know, with Tom Hanks. Why? Just because when we started talking about the movie, he was bringing out paintings, you know, of, of art, and he was making references and color palettes and all the rest of that stuff. And I went, that's the kind of way I love to think about this stuff, that we're not just lighting it and shooting it. It's like, no, we choose certain colors. We choose certain types of framing. We choose when to move the camera, when not to move the camera, what kind of cutting pattern. I mean, I had that damn movie so storyboarded out with these, you know, tiny little storyboards I made that looked like shit, but I didn't feel so bad when I saw Steven Spielberg's and Martin Scorsese's storyboards. They looked as bad as mine, but just as a way to, you know, get everything planned out ahead of time. And uh, Hal Trussell, who was the DP, he and I just had a really um, great understanding. Now, he was not a horror person. You know, he was making these images as beautiful as they could be. And even when we got into the stuff um, there's in the, in, the, in the mausoleum, there's a kind of a beauty, but, you know, a scare factor in the terms of the, the, you know, the dark shadows and stuff. I mean, a lot of people just really got freaked out over that bride corpse coming out of total darkness into the pool of light and then into the darkness again. Those basic things are just like funhouse type, you know, effects. You know, you see something, suddenly the lights go out, it's like, oh shit, where is it? You know, you, you, know, you, you try to embrace as many of those things that are just basic scare things. And of course, the claustrophobic aspect of being in a thing like that, being entombed which was actually the last shot of the movie was, you know, going to the one of the tombs that was sealed up and you hear Carol and Kitty inside screaming, banging, you know, that they had been, you know, put in there alive. Um, that was removed in the <laughs> Chuck Sellier cut. But that was the kind of thing that, you know, I wanted to leave the audience with um, or actually bookend the movie so that it began with this, this steady cam shot all the way through the cemetery up into this open crypt and then end the movie coming down that hall again, instead of it being open now, it's closed up and then you hear the two girls you know, inside. So there's certain things you try to artfully put in and it doesn't always end up being in the final you know, result, but you try, you know, it was my first movie, you know, uh, when I heard about, you know, George Lucas and how, you know, THX was taken away from him and, and uh, you know, Nick Castle had this great Peter Pan growing up story, which obviously became Pan uh, that Spielberg did. There's lots of us that, you know, you have these, these projects and for whatever reason, you know, they, they end up getting out of our hands and somebody else does them or they get cut and they're not exactly the way you envisioned it. But in the long run, who gives a fuck? I mean, <laughs> it's like it exists as what it is. If that's the way you saw it and that's the way you love it, you know, that's it. What was it like working with Adam West? Now, he was not your original choice for that role. Well, I had no choice. I, I, I literally just wanted a kind of a, you know, stick up their ass, straight kind of guy who married this woman who was going to be a wife. I mean, all the cliches of, you know, she just did what he wanted to do, the run the house and all the rest of that. But she knew she had something that, that plagued her. There was this sixth sense that she had about stuff, which, you know, he was like, oh, come on, knock it off. Um, and then, of course, this thing happened. So when we were auditioning, um, the casting director said to me, what do you think about Adam West? And I was like, Batman? And I was like, yeah. And I go, for this role? And she goes, yeah. I mean, the truth is nobody wants to hire him. Why? Well, because he's Batman. And I went, well, fuck that. No, we're hiring him. So I didn't even have him come in. I go, no, put Adam West in the movie. So it, that's the way it happened. Of course, the flip side of that, was that when he got the set and we started to rehearse, he was like, Tom, 
I just thought maybe this line could start like this, and then I would go down here, and then I can make it come up here. So it would be far more interesting than just reading the line flat. Don't you agree? I was like, uh, no. <laughs> it's it's got to be flat. It's got to be just, really? Well, this is, I said, I, I know, but Adam, it really sounds like, you know, Batman, I'm sorry, you know, and he goes, all right, well, it's your call, you're the director. So I managed to get all that, you know, out of his performance. Then again, ironically, when they did this kind of, you know, recut of the movie and they brought him in for some additional dialogue and some looping and stuff, guess what? <laughs> Nobody was like minding the store on that. So in the final product, there's a few of those times when, you know, Olivia, I don't think you should do that, you know, that came in. So, you know, it's Adam West, but I loved him. He was, he was so wonderful. He was so funny, um, you know, just one of those guys that you get, you can't help but love. And I don't know if anybody's seen his, that documentary somebody did on him recently. It's great. I mean, you know, and when he died, they projected the, you know, the, the bat on City Hall, the walls at City Hall. And I mean, that was just like, you know, one of the few things that Hollywood, you know, did that sort of remember this guy who was pretty much forgotten other than, you know, Batman. You, you do a great Adam West impression. Are you, do you do impressions? Are you an impressionist as well? No, I, I you know, shit has come out of me over the years. You know, <laughs> I, I don't really work on them or whatever. It just sort of, you know, you're describing something and you suddenly you go into some sort of ethnic voice and somebody will go, are you racist? I go, no, I love these people. Are you kidding? Why I know, I get that, that all the time. You know, it's just somehow when you're trying to explain how somebody, you know, talks or a situation or like, you know, I love talking about how when uh, Mike Haas and I would, before we wrote One Dark Night, we would go to every horror movie that played. And there were some theaters that played three of them, you know, a week. So you'd go down there and you sit through all of them. But what was great in, that, in the 70s and 80s was the audience was a part of the show. So, you know, you'd be sitting there and there'd be a whole, you know, gang of all different types of ethnicities but they would be yelling at the screen, communicating, you know, it's like, hey man, no, 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 don't go into that room. Are you crazy? Oh, motherfucker, shit. You know, come back in to see it again. And oh, no, no. And you know, up and down the aisles, it was, it was just great. And you laughed and you had a really good time because they were so into it. So when I wrote One Dark Night and, you know, Jason Lives, I wrote in specifically things that I knew the audience would respond to, like, you know, Friday the 13th when Elizabeth dies and she's got the money and the credit card and her hand opens and, you know, the money sinks, but the card floats, American Express card floats. I knew, and it always worked, somebody in the audience would go, don't leave home without it. And everybody would laugh. This guy thought he was the funniest guy ever. And he was completely set up <laughs> to do that. But that was to me something that the movies could do. But you can't do that in theater. You can't do that on television. It was this great you know, rapport that you could have with the audience. And, you know, I, put, I you know, tried to salt and pepper those in, you know, on those early movies, you know, for that. But once you start making television, it's like, you have no idea if something's working or not working. And now you go out and see shows and people are just so passive because of all these years of watching TV, they just watch them and don't, you know, get into it. And I go, guys, literally every, well, of course I can't now because of the fucking pandemic, but, um, every Friday night, whenever something opened that was in one of the genres where I'd expect an audience to respond, like it, when that came out, you know, got down there, got in line, you know, and packed audience, you know, was waiting for, you know, the old horror movie responses, you know, nothing. You know, the only thing that they responded to, at least that first screening, was the kiss when, the, you know, when, when the, the two, the kid and the girl kiss. Then they went, whoa! That was it. There was, there was nothing that they responded to with Pennywise, none of that. And it, it sort of breaks my heart in a way that people have become so, you know, passive about the experience. Um, and I'm hoping somebody comes up with something, you know, to kick ass. You know, that said, Jason Lives, uh, you know, was something that I tried to do that with. And now the, the sequel that I've written, you know, uh, Jason Never Dies, I built those things in, again, hoping I get it made and hoping that an audience will respond because I've tried to, you know, put things in there that if you're a fan of 
the Fridays, you know, franchise, you know, you'll know, and hopefully, you know, it'll take you back into those ones that we did in the eighties uh, that really sort of evoked a reaction. Now, now, Tom, I want to cut you off right there. I've got an envelope here with a hundred dollars in it. Now, for you, just to tell us a little something about the movie, just a hundred dollars for you to tell us a little something about Jason Never Dies. Okay. Are you are you game? Yeah, yeah. Are you kidding? To make a hundred bucks right now? Shit. You know, I'm on unemployment. A hundred bucks would, God, buy me. Uh, I don't know. Blu-ray won't buy me the box set though. That's going to be 160. The Friday 13th box set that's coming out. But um, okay, so you want to know something well, about free? something about the movie, right? Or about the script, I should say that I, that I wrote. All right, here's something nobody knows. You ready? I'm ready. 111 pages. I'm ready. 111, man. Blood. Oh, come on, Tom. You got to give us more than that. Well, I had like 114, but I, you know, cut it down. When do I get the money? Uh, I, will, I will PayPal it to you after the interview. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> so you're not, you're not getting a box set for free? I don't know yet. I hope so. Um, <laughs> I, I think that box, if you're a fan of the series, this box set, you're going to be watching this shit till like, you know, 2022. There is so many extras. And like, even with uh, Jason, Jason Lives, there is like, I think like seven commentaries all different, so you can watch that movie seven times and get seven different <laughs> commentaries about what's going on. Three of them are me, you know, because every time they get another release, you say, you come in and talk about it. And it's like, I don't want to talk about this again. It's like, oh, we're going to have the editor with you. Oh, okay. You know, so that there was a few things where I had somebody to bounce off of. But yeah, they, they've got C.J. Graham, who played Jason, is going to do one. Uh, Tom Matthews, who played Tommy Jarvis, you know, is doing a commentary. Um, but what I really wanted was, uh, when they did, uh, the Crystal Lake memories, uh, that particular Blu-ray that came out, they shot a thing, uh, with me in black and white in the cemetery, uh, where we did one dark night and where I wrote Jason lives. And I basically said, you know, that, you know, many people talk about where they shot something. Very few people talk about, you know, where they actually wrote it. And for most people, it's usually in their office at their computer, but I didn't type in those days. I, you know, never learned how to type. So I wrote longhand pencil paper and I went to that cemetery, which just so happened to be right next door to Paramount Pictures. And I, you know, found different spots in the cemetery to write. And that's kind of where that came out. And then there's also a reveal that I, you know, give in there about my, what I planned for the afterlife. Uh, I have a thing set up, which I'll be talking about in that interview uh, that's going to be on the box set. And, you know, so you'll see the, the documentary that was done and then me literally in front of my crypt um, talking about what my my plans are. If you would like to, you know, come by, say hello and see if I got a message for you from the other side. Yeah, I, I constantly see you posting pictures of your, your crypt on, on Facebook. I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, I, you know, well, it cost me a marriage, um, which, <laughs> you know, it wasn't just that, but that certainly added to it. Um, it was, uh, uh, I don't know if people have heard this story before, uh, but it is on that documentary. But real quick, they, my family threw a, a party for my 60th birthday and chose to do it at the cemetery, uh, the mausoleum, and basically invited everybody that I worked with pretty much anybody I knew, family, whatever, you know, huge kind of like, you know, my AFI tribute to the end of my life kind of thing. And, um, and then they showed One Dark Night there at the place where we shot it. So I went back the next day to thank the people that, you know, allowed this to happen. And then they told me about, you know, there was a couple crypts that were still available in that cathedral mausoleum, you know, that we used for One Dark Night. And I went, are you kidding? He's like, no, you want to see them? And I go, okay. <laughs> So they took me and there was one that was like right, you know, floor level. And just, I went, I got to have this. And it's like, 
well, it's like, you know, $50,000. I go, well, I don't have that, but can I make payments? Yeah. So for about, you know, three, four years, you know, I kept putting money away, you know, to make the payments and stuff. And suddenly this whole thing came into my head about at 60, I didn't want to say that I was going into my third act. I feel like I'm still on the second act and I still got, for me, 30 more years of doing stuff. It's just, just too many, you know, projects to do. There's too many things I want to still see with what's going on with the world. Not the bad stuff, but all the technology and crazy shit is just amazing. And so I wanted to basically, you know, have something happen after I'm gone. Not like what Houdini did where there'd be a seance, but literally filling that area around the crypt with positive energy. Um, I'm a real strong believer that what we know as ghosts and, you know, all this kind of spiritual stuff is actually just energy that we haven't been able to, you know, do a, um, a formula. You know, the whole thing with science is you have to be able to do it like three times in a row and always get the same results. Somehow in that world, one person can go into a house and feel a ghost. Somebody else doesn't feel anything. Somebody else just, you know, oh, God, this place stinks. Got to get out. You smell something? Yeah. So somehow this stuff can affect our senses. And yet we don't really have a, a, a way to recreate it or make it, you know, something that everybody experienced. So, you know, it started, of course, with One Dark Night, me getting into the whole kind of research of the you know, paranormal sciences and what's possible and what isn't possible and what we still haven't discovered. So that was kind of my, you know, game plan to try to use this crypt like a modem and put, you know, every birthday that I have, you know, we have a, what I call the crypt warming, uh, like a house warming, but people come, we all hang out. We just talk about our lives, what's going on. Nothing about death, nothing about me going away or anything just about life and laugh and, you know, you know, exchange crazy stories of what happened over the year. So every time you go in there, I just want that sort of, you know, positive energy, which is not unlike people who go like to their grandmother's house after she's passed away. And it's like, God, I can still, you know, feel her. Are you feeling her? Or are you remembering her? I don't know. As far as I'm concerned, there's stuff there that we just haven't been able to lock down. And I would love after I'm gone, the show must go on and have some sort of psychic experiment that hopefully will work. I won't be here to find out, but hopefully, you know, leading behind something that maybe certain people will pick up, maybe not, maybe somebody will see something, maybe they'll hear something. Again, I have no control over that. All I can do is try to set the stage for this, you know, as I've been for the last 10 years, and as I said, I want to do it for another 30, so that there's something kind of in the air, you know, in that, in that area that, that hopefully will, will create a paranormal experience. See, now that, that's interesting. So, I mean, uh, you're obviously into the unknown and you like the paranormal type of stuff, but like, you know, the fact that you're talking about energy, that really does kind of tap back into one dark night if you think about it, you know? Yeah, it did. All, it all came from researching that stuff, uh, talking to Thelma Moss about, um, you know, the use of Krillian photography, you know, which is in the book where obviously if you photograph, you know, your hand or face or anything, you know, there's an energy that, you know, are, are different colors depending on, you know, your aura uh, of how you, um, you know, how you buzz, how, you know, we all know that, that it's, you know, everything in here is electronic. You can mess with the brain with, you know, electronic pulses and stuff. And as I said, it's still very much a new science. It's still being experimented with but we also know there's a lot of old school things that have been around since the beginning of time. Things obviously the Native American cultures worked with and African cultures, very, very simple, you know, collecting of energy and people's, you know, way of thinking to create things. And to me, there's something there that, that fascinates me. And I had a, I've had a number of experiences that made me go, all right, I have no logical explanation for this. And if they happen like in New Orleans, you know, locals will go, oh yeah, yeah, that place has been known to be haunted. And they're like, no big deal. They never scare me. You know, the very first one did when I was 16, when I had an encounter, that kind of froze my shit. But after that, it's just been this fascination, this obsession with how do you, how do you make that connection or can we? 
Um, so it's not like I'm obsessed with something to scare people. And I tell people, you know, you don't have to be afraid of this. It's not anything that you need to be afraid of other than it's unknown. And that usually is what scares people. You know, this obviously COVID scares the shit out of us because we can't see it. And it's out there someplace and somebody can cough and it stays in the air. And then you walk into it. Maybe you get it. Maybe you don't get it. Other people go, oh, this is all bullshit. This is this whole political thing. Nobody knows for sure, but we certainly know the world has come to a standstill and all these people are, who make you know, billions of dollars are not able to make anything during this period. So there's something you know, that's putting enough fear in people that are going, all right, we got to figure this thing out and play by its rules. And to me, the paranormal, there's a lot of stuff in there that we, again, we don't know its rules yet. And I would love to feel like I'm attempting in my own simple little way as a guy that got fascinated with this world to see if I can, you know, shine a little light into the darkness. That's pretty interesting, you know, especially since this is something that I'm pretty sure in the next year or two after this whole COVID thing hopefully blows over, we're going to see probably a number of movies being made about COVID. Oh, yeah, that's already happening. Yeah, big time. Well, guess, I mean, all the writers are sitting home. They can't go anywhere. What, you know, what sits there as the thing that they can't get away from? You know, I started, I, I moved from an apartment to a, uh, a house uh, here in Burbank at the top of the year. And, you know, I said, yeah, I'm going to start getting the LA Times again, because, you know, I love, you know, reading the newspaper, everything was online. And I just love that it was delivered, you know, on your lawn and couldn't do that at an apartment because it would get stolen. So I never got to, you know, read it. So I start, you know, reading the paper, which was great. And then, you know, COVID hit and every fucking article in that paper from first page to last was about, you know, this virus. And it was, it was just, you know, too much negativity about the world and the hopelessness and we don't know and stuff. And it's like, I couldn't read the paper any longer because it's like, I went into a depression for about two months of, you know, what's the point of writing a script? What's the point of doing anything? What, what you know, we don't know when any of this is gonna blow over. Um, but then I kind of pulled myself up and said, just start creating, get your mind out of everything that's not working and find some stuff that can work and just try to be optimistic that this, this will go away at some point. We're finding ways of kind of still making movies. My son and daughter, <clears throat> or 30 and 33 are in Montana right now shooting on this Kevin Costner series called Yellowstone. And they've been there for about a month now. And they have, you know, the whole crew, everybody has to obey very strict, you know, rules about, you know, getting tested every day, you know, making sure that you're in little sections, you know, the actor section, the writer, I mean, the director and the AD and stuff section, you know, they're part of the production assistance, you know, area. So there's, you know, ways that they're trying to see if they can still make movies or make TV and, you know, not let people get this thing. But, you know, it's every day, you know, you don't, you don't know who might, you know, picked it up someplace. Um, they don't want them to go places on the weekend. So it's, it's really, really restrictive, but we will survive. You know, we did in, in 1918 with that, whole virus and that lasted like two years, which I don't even want to think about that this could go on for another year. But, you know, ev everything kind of got back to normal eventually. So we just have to, you know, wait this thing out and stay as safe as we can say, stay. I, I know a lot of people say right now because of COVID, it's the best time to create because uh, the, the Duplass brothers said, hey, create something now because in a year they're going to be looking for content. Because a lot of movies have shut down. And of course, I'm a, I don't know if you know this, I'm a general manager at a movie theater. And everything is getting pushed back. And it's hard for movie theaters themselves to survive because we're showing a bunch of old stuff that a lot of people, you know, how, how many more times can we keep showing the Spielberg, Amblin films, and people will still come out to see it to support the theater? A lot of people are not. So a lot of theaters are trying their own thing. I'm doing a, a Friday night horror night at my theater. Um, but the Duplass brothers said something along the lines of, hey, Make something now, even if it looks cheap, because you never know who's going to get it because people are hungry for content. And, you know, that's how our show came about, you know. But, um, no, that, that's a good point about writers just have nothing to do but write. Yeah, it's just, as I said, you have to get inspired. Um, I was being, you know, 
made depressed. I couldn't even write a depressing horror movie. It just, I didn't even feel like creating that. So it took a while to get over that hump. And then once, you know, once I locked into that, like I'm doing a, a, a horror movie now that I'm very excited about. It's, you know, obviously it has nods to things that we've seen in the past, but not executed in the same way, not using certain things that, you know, have not been used before. Um, and I really, you know, every day when I kind of sit there in front of it and it sort of speaks to me and takes me on its journey, you know, I'll stop and go, wait a minute, has this been done some other time in some other movie? And, you know, keep trying to make sure I'm not in other people's territory. And then I go, you know what, you can't do that because any great work of art, music, uh, you know, uh, paintings, um, sculpture, anything, is pieces of other things that influence that creative person. And you can go back and go, ah, you got that from there. And that person got that from there. And then, you know, we do kind of exist in this creative, you know, energy force that people will pick up, you know, certain things. But as I tell the students that I teach now, you know, at a, a film college, you know, you have to embrace them. I mean, which I love about Martin Scorsese. You know where I got that shot? You know where I took that, you know? They, they don't make any bones about the influences and how they use them. But when they filter through somebody else, your sensibilities, the fact that you borrow from all these different things, it's different. It's not going to be exactly the same. So if I tell somebody, you know, shoot this thing like Kubrick would, it's like, well, now I'm going to rip him off. No, you're not. You know, he got this idea from someplace else. Spielberg got that shot from David Lean. I mean, it's like you have to say, look, these people are out here. Look at the masters, you know, imitate them in, in the beginning, steal what you can. And then know in time, you know, the, the sources, you know, the influences are going to disappear and it's only going to be you. And what happens to a lot of filmmakers, as you've probably seen, they just start making copies of themselves and their work suddenly stops being that interesting, you know, because it's like, God, do we just see this? Um, so, you know, you do have to be open to other influences and, of course, life, trying to find things that, you know, inspire you, whether it's the catacombs, you know, or, you know, my obsession as a child with angels, which led to date with an angel, you know, those things, you know, you, you glom onto and you go, yeah, that's mine. That's something that happened to me and that's something I feel. And then you put it into a, as I did, a Frank Capra kind of uh, formula. Uh, of the nice guy that has something horrible happen and he's, you know, he comes out okay at the end. So you're, you're always working with craft and structure, but you're, you know, the ideas have to come from places that, you know, hopefully inspire you. Your film work has inspired me in my film. And it's, it's easy. If you read any of my scripts or watch any of the things I've made, I've taken pieces of how you shoot a film, you know, how you, how, you, you know, the gothicness, how you light it and whatnot. It, it just, that stuff has always interested me, and that's one thing I've, I've I like to say borrowed but blatantly ripped off from you in my career. There's there's a great um, book I highly recommend for anybody out there, uh, called Artist Steal, you know, and it comes from that thing you know that hacks borrow artists steal, and it's a series of quotes from everybody from writers uh, to Jim Jarvis and all these people in the industry as well as you know, just in art in general, talking about how they ripped off these people, you know, to make their, especially their early work. And nobody really noticed. The only person that really constantly got put down about it uh, was Brian De Palma, because, you know, his stuff was so blatantly Hitchcock. Anybody that had any kind of film knowledge knew that. But did the audience give a shit? Fuck no. I mean, it was like, that was new. And in time, De Palma you know, went past Hitchcock and really created his own world. Some of those camera moves and things that, you know, he did in Dress to Kill and some of their other movies and the stuff in The Untouchables is pure De Palma. But, you know, I grew up in that generation where we were going out and seeing his stuff. And of course, as film scholars ourselves, you know, we're going, ah, I know where he got that. I, you know, we think he were, you know, smarter than everybody else. It didn't matter, you know, the success of the movie, all that mattered. And of course, when he hit Carrie, that was it. I mean, he really took Stephen King, great acting, you know, all these things that, you know, he basically used his influences, you know, split screen he put in there, you know, deep, 
uh, we call the split diopter. So something's in focus in the foreground and the background. You know, all these great little tricks and effects, put them into that movie and it was still, you know, an amazing and now classic horror movie. What, what is your favorite De Palma movie? I guess it would have to be Carrie. And I only, again, because I saw it in the theater with a preview audience and none of us knew what we were going to see. And that, you know, last shot, you know, when hand comes up and grabs Sissy, people, you know, I tell you, well, I mean, they were on the fucking ceiling. They jumped so high. It was, <laughs> it was amazing. Um, you know, seeing The Exorcist, which is still my all time favorite, you know, in a theater with people that first week when it came out, I don't think we're ever going to have that again. You know, people passing out, going up the aisle, running up the aisle, ambulances out front um, to, to take people, people at the end of the movie, just kind of frozen, staring at the screen, not knowing what to do. I mean, it really messed with people's heads. And I went and I studied that movie, every aspect of it. I wanted to know how the hell the freaking and Blatty and, you know, all the people involved with that make that thing work the way it worked. It was, you know, it's still unbelievable to me, you know, it doesn't have the same obviously impact as it did back then because it was brand new, but it's still like Rosemary's Baby. It's still, you know, a really good, scary movie. One thing, one thing I do want to ask you now, I was watching a film and this is a, a film that was made by your friend and I, I noticed a familiar character in it and I'm like, oh wait, that's Tom. And uh, it was Critters too. Could you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, I, uh, Years ago, when One Dark Night played at the Academy of Science Fiction, Fantasy, and Horror, um, a guy came up to me afterwards, introduced himself, Mick Garris, and said how much you know he he you know loved the movie and things, and you know you know we should be friends, and you know that started, and that was like whatever that was, eighty two, eighty three, and we've been very good friends ever since, and. Um, so when Mick was making his movies, he was constantly giving cameos to other horror directors. You know, Toby Hooper was in one of them, Clive Barker, John Landis, I think, and a couple of them and stuff. So when he was doing Critters 2, he said, you know, would you like to do a part? And I was like, mm, I don't know. Um, and he goes, no, 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 come on, everybody else. All right, all right, all right. So for me, it was a great chance to go back and, you know, do acting. And also, he, you know, since I was directing quite a bit in those days, I was really taught what it is like to be an actor, you know, sitting in your dressing room or trailer, you know, for hours and hours and hours and you fall asleep and then they bang on your door at three in the morning, go, okay, we're ready for you, Mr. McLaughlin. And then you go out and it's freezing cold and you're trying not to show that you're shaking and you have to lay on the ground that's ice cold as they put, effect, you know, makeup effects and stuff on you. And I went, God bless the actors. I mean, the shit we ask them to do, and they have to just sit there and take it. So it gave me a huge appreciation is what I kind of got from the movie. And, uh, you know, Mick put together the Masters of Horror, which was, I don't know, if you know about that. It's a, you know, like a kind of a- Love it. Love it. Club of, uh, well, well, it became a series, but, you know, originally it was just groups of us getting together and having dinner and, and talking. And the amazing thing is that all of us, and it doesn't matter if it was, you know, Tom Holland, Rob Zombie, you know, John Carpenter, you know, any of the other, you know, old school guys, as well as the, you know, up and coming directors, everybody has this childlike boy. God, yours was so great. Mine was shit, but yours was so great. You know, or I just read this thing. I couldn't do this, but you could do this. It was this incredible bonding, you know, with all these guys. And we took, you know, every time we take pictures of everybody and the group went from, I think it was like 13, 14 of us in the beginning to like 40, you know, people. It just got, you know, huge. And then at a certain point, you know, Mick just said, you know, this has just gotten too too big and I can't tell people they can't come. So he kind of like, you know, shut it down for a while, but then came up with a series off of that. And I was working at that time on some other films because I had a, a couple of TV things that, you know, I signed to. So unfortunately I didn't get to do any of those, but you know, it was a great thing to kind of take that idea and, you know, make a series out of it. And there's some, you know, great episodes in that. And, you know, Nick has been amazing with the world of horror. He's, he's just been kind of the, the go-to, most knowledge, has a podcast, you know, that he, he talks with all these great people. So um, 
yeah, I, def I, I, I definitely have treasured my relationship with him over the years. I have, uh, I have two dreams in life. It's not to win an Oscar. It's none of that stuff. <laughs> one, of the, one of the dreams is to get slimed at the Nickelodeon Choice Awards. And the other dream is to... Yeah, I know. Yeah, I, I really... I'm, I'm living on the edge, aren't I? But the other dream is to be invited to a Masters of Horror dinner with Mick Garris and some other people. Because, you know, I heard about that years ago when I was a kid and reading Fangoria. Somebody posted on the Fangoria forums like, oh, another Masters of Horror dinner happened and look who showed up. It's funny because Nick started as a publicist in the business. And so yeah. he was really great at going in and, you know, going on the set of The Thing, the John Carpenter, The Thing, and Spielberg's movies, Joe Dante's movies. And, he, you know, he got to be friends with these guys. So as the years went on, you know, he, you know, he just kind of, you know, continued his dream of writing and directing and stuff. But he had this, you know, amazing group of great filmmakers, you know, around him. But he's always shared everything. I mean, you know, we we wrote um, one of the uh, amazing stories together that Robert Zemeckis directed. Um, and, you know, the couple of other things we collaborated on the She-Wolf series. And then I did the They Came From Outer Space series that we did for Universal. I mean, all things where, you know, we, we would start something and then if it didn't seem like it was as cool as we thought it was going to be, you know, we stepped aside and let somebody else, you know, run it. But, you know, he's got, you know, an incredible heart. There's a, there's a big dinner tribute thing that's coming up that they're doing for him that, you know, all of us are going to be, you know, a part of. But I, one of the, here's one of the cool stories. I, you know, you know, I tell pretty much the same stuff. So I'm always talking about Friday and stuff. But this, this story I loved. We had a Master of Horror uh, dinner and Quentin Tarantino showed up. So, of course, we were all like, you know, because it's like, you know, he's really not known as a horror director, but he certainly knows everything about anything that's run through a camera. I mean, working at a video store all those years, he is like, like a, 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 a genius of that, of that stuff. Like his mind's like, like, like a Rolodex. He can just go anywhere and go, oh, okay, I know what that is. So through the whole meeting, I kind of was at the end of the table and I was sitting there going, God, I'd love to just go and, you know, shake his hand, say hello or whatever, but I was just kind of overwhelmed. So, the, you know, the, the dinner broke up, you know, everybody was leaving and, and things. And, you know, I was walking to my car and, you know, I saw Quentin, you know, drive by down the alley. And I went, OK, there goes that opportunity. And just before I got to the car, he stopped, his car stopped and he drove backwards and he got out and he went, Tom McLaughlin, One Dark Night, um, H, uh, HBO, Thorn, EMI, Meg Tilly. He just starts listing off, you know, everybody that's in it, then starts listing TV movies that I had done. He said, you know, I just want to tell you, you know, I love your work. And, and I was just, I mean, absolutely stunned. I don't know how long I stood in that parking lot <laughs> stunned, but that, I mean, him doing that was like one of the, you know, the great moments of my life. And then later on, we were at another meeting, or the gathering, and he sat next to me and he turned and he said, I want to tell you about this, this movie. We're actually going to be a couple of movies. And he basically pitched what he at that time called Grindhouse, which was going to be, you know, these B movies that him and Robert Rodriguez was going to do. And, you know, he pitched that thing to me and his energy, his charisma, you know, you were just like buzzing inside at the end of this incredible pitch, all the details and stuff. I mean, I was ready to, you know, pull out my wallet and give him a credit card going, yeah, I'll put money to that. That sounds, you know, amazing. And he told me a lot of stuff that ended up not being in the movie or little, you know, short ideas that were going to be kind of, you know, put between the movie that were also incredibly cool. But having that opportunity to meet somebody like that, who's obviously, you know, major game changer in this, in this business, um, was, you know, again, thanks to Mick and putting that group together. And going back to borrowing, I mean, Quentin is another one. Everything you see is from some other movie, but he puts it together in such a way and then puts that Quentin dialogue in there. I mean, he gets away with stuff nobody else could get away with. And the movies are, you know, for those of us who love movies are incredibly entertaining. You know, I can watch his stuff over and over, never be bored, be flipping around middle of one of his, you know, like, like the latest one, the Once Upon a Time in Hollywood and just start watching it wherever it is in the movie. Um, Cause it's, it's just, you know, really entertaining stuff. 
I uh, it's funny about Grindhouse because that was a movie I saw in theaters and I loved it, and that was what made me make my first uh, film, uh, Macabre Medicine. We we uh, we looked at the money that we had and the gear that we had, and we we're like, well, if we make it like an old exploitation film, similar to what we tried to do with Grindhouse, which it's a shame that that wasn't a, a bigger success because I would have loved to see more of those movies under the Grindhouse name. Um, but God, it was just so cool to see that they try to bring back that feeling. Cause I'm, you know, I'm a young guy. I'm only 31. I never got to sit in the Grindhouse, you know, but going there and watching two films back to back with these cheesy, you know, tr fake trailers in between. And that's what we did with Macabre Medicine. And it was just a big inspiration. Well, you know, what happened is that, you know, when they released that thing, cause I saw it at the Chinese theater on, on the opening weekend is as soon as the first movie was over, people got up and walked out. They thought that was it, it's over. So, you know, they didn't even, you know, hang around for Quentin's. And that was like, holy shit. So they had to break them apart, you know, and put the, you know, the trailers as part of one and part of another. Um, it, it just was a concept that, you know, this generation of film goers didn't quite grasp. So I know you've talked about Friday the 13th part six with every single person, um, but you haven't talked about it with me. Yes. No, I, uh... Frank Mancuso Jr. saw One Dark Night, and I'm guessing he contacted you after five? After five, yeah. Um, normally, they usually do two years between the movies um, so that, you know, people sort of forget and what the last one was and really anxious for the next one to come. Well, they knew they screwed up by not having Jason at the end of it, um, that it was going to be possibly Tommy Jarvis. And I guess that really concerned everybody at Paramount that, you know, the franchise could be over because obviously they did the final chapter and now a new beginning and people were going, no, I don't like this new beginning. There are still hardcore fans to that movie, part five, Quentin being one of them. You know, he, he told me, I love yours, but part five is my favorite. I go, why? I'm curious. He goes, because it's so slimy and disgusting and the sex and the, that's what a Friday the 13th should be. I went, okay, I can see why you didn't like mine. Um, I didn't say I didn't like it. I loved it. No, no it's just like, that, that to me is what, you know, and again, it's that grindhouse mentality that he has. Uh, but be that as it may, a lot of people were upset because they thought, you know, Jason was gone and he was going to be, you know, played by somebody else that wasn't actually Jason. So um, after a year only, they decided um, that they needed to, you know, green light uh, another one. Um, and he saw, you know, my, uh, one dark night, as you say, and he loved the whole Gothic approach that I did and asked me, you know, or asked my agent if I would come in and meet on it. I didn't want to, because I kind of avoided all those, you know, slasher movies. Cause I really wanted to do more things like one dark night. But when I met with him and, you know, he said, look, I just want you to figure out some way to bring back Jason and anything else you can do. And I will, can I put humor in it? What do you mean? I could, well, I just want the characters to be likable and I'd love to have a sense of, you know, a little bit of satire about the fact that, you know, it's part six and there's so many of these. And he goes, well, just don't make fun of Jason. I go, no, no, I, I still want it to be a horror movie. I still want him to be a, you know, in my mind, a monster, like in the old days of what a monster was. Um, and based on that, you know, he said, yeah. And I, you know, wrote a treatment which is, you know, in the back of that infamous book of mine, A uh, Strange Idea of Entertainment. And if you read the treatment in the back, it's pretty much the movie. You know, what I laid out there was what was greenlit and, you know, put it, you know, into script form at the cemetery. And, um, it, you know, I really, really, honest to God, thought this thing was going to bomb. I was terrified of it that because I thought the fans were going to be upset that I was having a sense of humor you know, with the Friday thing, um, that they just kind of, you know, weren't going to get the way I was, you know, breaking the fourth wall or doing some of the things that I was doing. Um, but much to my absolute shock, especially after all these years, it kind of is like, you know, the entry one for a lot of people who go, all right, I know you don't like slasher movies, but watch this one. Um, and I, I look at that not like I'm so proud of it. It's just sort of the way I saw it. And I, you know, I get a lot of you know, shit about the fact that, you know, we did a sex scene, but, you know, she's not naked. And as far as I was concerned, you know, I, as we were ready to do the scene and it was written, you know, for her to be naked, you know, I said, you know, Darcy, how do you feel about doing this? She goes, 
are you really set on the idea of having to have me naked? I, you know, I've done this kind of stuff before and I kind of am uncomfortable with it. And besides, you know, I didn't sign any rider saying that, you know, I would be doing this. And I said, you're uncomfortable with it? She goes, um, yeah, I kind of am. I go, I don't want you to be uncomfortable. I want you to full out do the scene. It's a fun, funny scene because you're making him wait till the end of the song, you know, before he comes, you know, uh, you know, we'll look at Tom Fridley's tits. Fine. So, you know, we went and did it. And again, I thought, but, you know, it, it ended up being like, it's the only one that doesn't do that. And it wasn't necessarily something I set out to do. It just sort of happened. But now I kind of embrace it uh, that, you know, it did make it, you know, different. And it's still, you know, I wasn't looking for it to be a heavy duty sex scene. I was really having to, you know, as a joke and seeing Jason watching the motorhome bouncing up and down and, you know, doing the Mike Myers thing with the tilt of the head and, you know, all those little, you know, kind of, you know, horror um iconic things in there um, but you know once we made it and it you know came out the reaction with the audience was incredible it just we didn't have as huge an audience come two reasons one a lot of people went nah I'm not going to go see another one of those it's going to be like the last one and then we were the week after aliens opened and that had obviously such a huge you know impact that those people either came back or brought other people. So we were, you know, number two instead of number one, you know, in the box office that week. So it, you know, was kind of like, well, okay, we did something different, you know, but it'll be forgotten and that'll be that. So as I said, it's always, always is going to be a huge mystery to me how that thing, you know, has continued for so many years and, you know, how many people really love it. We're, we're doing a big reunion on Zoom this Monday, um, I wish I had all the details, but they haven't sent it to me yet. They just go, would you like to be part of the Zoom call? And we're getting as many of the cast together as possible. It's for some uh, horror festival that they do, I think, in New York. And I'm sorry I don't have that information, but um, of course, probably by the time this thing airs, <laughs> it'll have come and gone since it's Monday. But, um, you know, it, it, it's we're all still friends. I mean, we all still stay in touch. We all you know, do Facebook messages. Uh, we show up at these conventions together. We, you know, we hang out. It is literally like we all went to college together for that, those, you know, six, seven weeks that we were together. And, and of course, everybody's happy because the movie keeps sending them residuals. So, you know, it's not like falling away like a lot of other, you know, movies. But they, we did share a kind of a really unique bond on that thing. And we were, you know, just really having fun making it. So, you know, it was one of the great experiences, you know, of my life in filmmaking was that was making that film. So, so why not go and do part seven? Did they not, were you not asked or? Oh, yes. <laughs> I thought maybe you'd heard this story a million times, but yeah, it, as, as soon as I, um, as soon as I finished this thing and we saw the reaction in the theaters, Frank came to me and he goes, okay, let's talk about part seven. I said, Frank, I have no idea what I would do in part seven. He goes, well, you came up with all this great stuff why couldn't you do it again I go I don't I, I I literally put everything I could think of in that movie I tried to make the characters savvy about Jason I tried to do this that I don't put in little kids you know the camp all, all this stuff I don't know so he looks at me for a second and you know and so it's, okay how about this Jason meets Freddy and I went well that would be great I mean Frankenstein meets the wolf man but great but how are you gonna eat their you know, Freddy's with New Line, this is Paramount. And he goes, I'm working on it. So he came back to me in about a week and said, you know, well, they won't do it, so we can't. Do you have another idea? And without any thought whatsoever, I went, well, you guys have Cheech and Chong. What about Cheech and Chong meet Jason? And he laughed, you know, and I said, no, it could be, you know, very funny. You know, they're, you know, they're camping out there or they're camp counselors. I don't know, you know, somehow, you know, they know about this and, you know, and of course they've got, you know, a field of, weed that they're growing and, you know, have Jason coming through it. And it's like, oh, no, man, no, 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 he's cutting it down, man. You know, I mean, they're just things I thought both audiences would, would love. And he said, you know, I think there's one audience, you know, for Cheech and Chong and another one, you know, for the horror audience, you know. And I go, I, I don't think so. I think everybody smokes the same weed. 
you know, they, they go to these things to laugh and have a great time. And, um, but Frank just felt, you know, it, it wouldn't work. So I said, all right, well, I'll, I'll think about it and see if I can come up with something. 32, I guess it's, you know, 32 years later, <laughs> I finally thought of something. Um, but I actually gathered a whole bunch of ideas together. So this, this script for uh, Jason Never Dies is kind of a combination of a number of elements, but all sort of brought together going, you know, back to the Crystal Lake area, but going there in the winter. Um, Crystal Lake is gonna be frozen over. So one of the secrets, uh, it was really a secret, is that, you know, normally we see Jason, you know, in Crystal Lake, like pursuing somebody. This time you're gonna see him go across Crystal Lake pursuing somebody. Uh, and of course, you know, running on the ice is not the easiest way of trying to get across, you know, to, to the other side. And of course, you know, Jason's going to keep coming steady. So there's trying to make use of things in a winter setting and just the whole plot and some of the stuff that's going to actually kind of harken back to my Jason Lives because I'm setting it 13 years after Jason Lives. Uh, so it will be 1999. So there'll still be that sort of 80s, you know, because, you know, it's always like 10 years for stuff to kind of happen and then kind of before it starts to become something else. Um, so it'll still have that sort of vibe to it. But I've tried to put in some, you know, cool surprises, some things that you haven't seen in a Friday before and um, doing a couple little things different with Jason that just in terms of, you know, what has happened after you've been underwater for 13 years. So there's a, you know, there's, I've tried to put some fresh, exciting things in there. And, um, you know, some of the stuff I will be talking about on the box set. And um, there's going to be a, actually a bloody, disgusting article coming out, I think, this week, um, where I'm going to reveal probably far more than I should. <laughs> but I felt like, you know, this lawsuit, we don't know when it's going to happen and get resolved. And with the pandemic, there's no court, you know, courthouse stuff going on. So I thought, you know, I... I want people to sort of enjoy what, you know, hopefully will be and not give away everything, of course, but, you know, at least get much more of a sense of what the plot is. And in the box set, I'm going to show 18 concept drawings of how, you know, some of the scenes will look, some of the sequences will look and what, you know, Jason's going to look like. So, you know, I, again, I, I want people to go all right, I want, I want to see this movie. I want this fucker to make this movie. And, you know, ho hopefully they like what, I'm, what I've thought up and that, uh, you know, they'll, you know, back me when, when the time comes. Oh, I think you'll have no problem with that. You certainly got a fan in me and, I, and a lot of other people want to see you make this movie. You know, especially you're doing something that I've always wanted to see was just the winter theme. And it's funny because the treatment that I wrote, I actually had a scene where there's some people on the ice and Jason comes after them. And with each step, Jason's cracking the ice. So it was more of a threat. There's something about that winter theme that is more of a threat too, which I think is really cool. So I love the fact that you're taking that and you're embracing it and you're going to make a great movie. I just know it because I've been waiting to see you make another Friday the 13th since part six. Yeah, it'll, it'll still have a kind of a dark sense of humor. Um, the, 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 the females in the movie, which is all females, Jason's the only male in the movie, not for political reasons, because this is what, you know, the story is and the people that are part of the story, they have to be female. Um, and I've given them, you know, like really like tough ass banter and they're tough ass girls. So, they, you know, there's, Jason's gonna have his hands, you know, full on with a couple of these women. When they when they have the face-offs so i've tried to you know again have things that we haven't seen quite like this and that these ladies are completely oblivious to jason Voorhees. you know they came in from another state you know they've never heard any of the stories so when this guy suddenly starts you know busting into the you know where they are it is like who the fuck is this what is going on i mean you know and so it's it's a much more frightening thing for them because it just seems like, you know, it, it, it makes no sense. And, you know, where did this guy come from and what, what does he want and why is he hacking people up? But he will have an agenda just like on Jason Lives. 
you know, I had Jason have the agenda. He's got to get Tommy. He, you know, raised him out of the grave. He was more than happy to stay down there. But, you know, he did this, so now he's going to pay. And anybody who gets in his way, obviously, you know, got aced. So this, he's also got, you know, agenda, but somebody else has an agenda too. So they're, you know, I, I've tried to put some things in there that hopefully will be fresh and uh, that people will love. But you're right. I mean, part of the reason that I can't do it like a fan funded film is because by shooting it all in the snow, all in a winter setting, basically at night, it is miserable. I mean, to, to shoot in, in snow, as anybody will tell you, but to you know, make scenes that happen like in, you know, cabins and things like that um, and shoot in the real environment while everybody's outside freezing to death, you know, because you can't put everybody in there, just seemed like it would make it for, make it for long, make, make a long and also very painful shoot. So my feeling was if I had more money, did it more as a studio picture, we could build the sets, we could, you know, shoot obviously the exteriors of what we do need and get that to work. But if you start talking about, you know, freezing over Crystal Lake, that's a big set. That's a, you know, a, a thing that really, either you hide it with a lot of darkness and just pools of light, you know, or you try to make it a little bigger and, and you know, create something like that, that could work. So I sort of painted myself into a, a corner with it having to be a, a little bigger budgeted film. Um, and which is why I also got to wait out this lawsuit because like, you, you just can't make a flat out Friday the 13th film and call it that, or Jason in it and call it that, because one of these two guys are gonna have the rights. Right now, Sean has Jason and, and Victor has Friday the 13th. And, you know, there's no sharing that. They, they, they've got to come to some sort of compromise if they want to have, you know, both things. Yeah, which is a shame because I'd like to see yours sooner than later. I would too, you know. Well, as I said, I got 30 years so on a building in a wheelchair, you know, doing it, but I don't care. I, you know, if I can get it made, that's great. And I don't know if the forces in power, you know, Warner Brothers, New Line, they already have, you know, a script and another way of going about this or remaking it, the original again, which I think Victor, you know, wanted to do. You know, I don't know where, you know, the, the money is going to go with this, but I'm just hoping that if the fans kind of hear what I want to do, that they'll, you know, create enough of a groundswell, like, you know, no, we want to see this. And it is, you know, different. I mean, it's different in like the new Halloween was different in that, you know, it, it kind of went back and picked up where the other one ended and not included all the, the sequels. And I'm kind of doing that with mine is, you know, kind of picking up where I left off 13 years later, but I've written it in such a way that it is a, story that was found and did this actually happen or not so it, it's a kind of a it can kind of be set alone as, as a you know a, a friday the 13th story without saying oh well he already went to outer space and he went to manhattan and he went to hell and he did you know i i'm sort of like going all right that's that's the way the series went this is just a jason story you know in a winter setting you know at crystal lake I'm, I'm sure if we all, all the fans rallied behind you, which I think they will, I'm sure it'll, it'll appeal to the studios because they'll see it as money, you know? So I'm, I'm hoping for it. I really am. Well, I'll provide the torch. I'll, I'll provide the torches and the, and the banners, you know, I'll, I'll love the storm Warner Brothers. You, hey, if you do that, you tell me when I'm there. Okay. How, how much control did you have over the marketing of Jason Lives? I, I, I have to say nothing. Um, Frank Mancuso flew down to uh, Covington, Georgia, where we were shooting, and he had this thing he wanted to do with the camera moving, like with the Citizen Kane between the bars, you know, up towards the tombstone, you know, the, the coffin coming up, opening up, and then, you know, Jason lives in there. That was, you know, totally his, and he, you know, kind of ran that, you know, the shooting of that. And I watched and I enjoyed it. Um, same thing with the, uh, you know, the one sheet and stuff. That was all, you know, come up with the, by the ad department of, you know, how they wanted this one, you know, to look. Um, I've seen some created ads over the years and things that are on other box sets and stuff that I really love kind of better than what the original was. But, 
you know, the original, you know, obviously is iconic now. People see that, you know, they, they know that. Yep, that's the one for Jason Lives. So, you know, that, there's things that you just, as a director, you know, you don't necessarily get involved in and you just hope they come up with something cool because that's what, you know, that's the carrot that, that draws the person in, is the, you know, those things. Now, I've got some fast action questions. These are questions that are really quick, you know, just something that you can just kind of give us one or two word answers. Um, how, how do you get inspired with your writing? What do you do when you write? Where do you go a certain place? Do you listen to music? What do you do? Uh, in the old days, I used to go any place that seemed like you would never want to go to that you couldn't concentrate. I'd go to baseball games. I would go to um, Disneyland. I would go to parks where the carousel, like in Griffith Park, where the carousel where Walt Disney sat on a bench and came up with Disneyland, the kids playing and stuff. But, you know, or Christmas time, you know, like where people are shopping and stuff. I somehow could focus in with all this distraction around me. Since that time, you know, I've been working, you know, here in my office on a laptop like everybody else. And uh, if I, you know, get dry, I go back to, you know, a, a book line paper and go back and do it by hand because I can think fast and write fast that way and then go back and, you know, turn it into type. What motivates you to keep going when you get depressed? What keeps you, what keeps that spark alive inside of you? You know, this is going to sound, this is going to sound a little heavy, but I'll say it because it's true. I feel that everybody on this planet is here for some reason. They, they're going to leave behind something that the fact they were here made a difference in some way, shape, or form. And if it's nothing more than they were a great father or that they were a great mom or that they you know, were an incredible student and inspired some other student to work harder, it doesn't matter what it is, but there's a purpose. And ever since I was a kid, and of course having a father who was a magician and wanting to be a filmmaker and a fire eater, which is kind of a freaky thing, I suddenly decided I wanted to entertain people. And I wanted to do things that hopefully people would go, God, that was great. And ever since that time, it's like I'm constantly trying to find something that pleases somebody else. You know, I'm more about, you know, I don't care if I suffer through it or even if it's not my necessarily cup of tea, like making Lifetime movies. I tried to do it the best I could for the audience that intended. And I feel like all of us in life need to kind of look at that, go, look, I am here for a reason. Whatever that is, I'm going to keep, you know, doing what I'm doing or find something because what I'm doing doesn't seem like it's really, you know, meaningful to anybody other than me. And, you know, it doesn't mean you got to create great music or great literature or anything. As I said, it can be just as simple as the way you treat, you know, other people in life. And uh, there was something, you know, the, there was a rule in Shangri-La in Frank Capra's Lost Horizon uh, that was from the guru in there. And, it, and the one simple rule was be kind. And I think, you know, that, which also came out of ET, you know, that thing of being kind to people uh, means a lot, you know, so that people after, after you're gone, it's like, I miss them. They were the kindest person. And things like that to me is, is very, very important. Do you have any advice for aspiring filmmakers? Anything that you want to kind of give them a nugget of knowledge? Yeah. Um, if you have a passion for something, no matter what people tell you, if you really feel like in your heart, this is something you really want to do and you're willing to risk failure, you're willing to risk, you know, it, it, it's like the, 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 the scene in uh, Cuckoo's Nest when, you know, Jack Nicholson says he's going to pick up this, you know, water thing, this cement, and going to throw it through a window, and, and they all bet on, and, he, you know, and he struggles, and he struggles, and he doesn't do it, and he walks by, and everybody's kind of smirking, and he turns back and said, you know, at least I tried. And to me, that was a great message, because you're not always going to succeed. So if you're willing to at least try, you'll be surprised how many times you actually do. But if you don't take that risk, if you don't take that step, it never happens and you spend the rest of your life, you know, lamenting that. Some people a lot and they end up being, you know, sitting around bars going, you know what I could have done, you know, and to me, I, I didn't want that. And I feel like for, 
for people who are, want to be filmmakers or want to be writers or whatever, go and do it. And it's never been easier than it is now with having, you know, a cell phone that shoots some really great images. You know, you can get a tiny device on there for, I don't know, $30, $40 where the sound can even sound better. And you can edit on these free programs, these free software. You can make stuff, make it, put it on YouTube, you know, put it on Vimo, whatever you need to do, get it out there and let people see it. And you don't know who's going to see it one day and go, you got any other ideas? That was pretty good. So just do it. You know, it was, it was something that Frank Capra told me when I was going on and on about how nobody would buy my script for Date with a Ninja. He just kept saying to me, do it, just do it. But Frank, do it. And this was before Nike <laughs> grabbed onto that. But that, that's, been a, that's been a real important thing for me and to pass on, you know, don't give up your dreams, just do it. Last but not least, this is an odd question, but I always ask everybody on this show, what is your favorite craft service item? You know, I wouldn't have an answer for that, except the second you said that, my mind went Cracker Jacks. And I don't even remember when Cracker Jacks were even on, <laughs> on a craft service set. But there's something about something like that because you can grab it, you eat it, it's popcorn, it's sweet, it's got nuts in it. You know, it, it just seemed like, you know, if, I, if you're in a hurry, like, you know, you have to be as a director, you can't sit around peel an orange or do any of that healthy stuff. You gotta grab something, you know, s stick it in as fuel, which is part of my problem. Food is fuel to me more than anything else, just so you can, you know, have something so you don't get a headache. But yeah, that, that was the one that popped in my head for some bizarre reason. That's a good choice, because mostly all I see on craft service tables these days are fruit snacks, you know, just these little fruit snacks. And now, and now, and now everything's gonna be sealed like you can't believe that nobody can touch nothing. You know, it's a yeah. whole different world. No more granola or anything. It's going to be crazy. You yeah. Know, fruit probably be a lot different. And... Yeah, we're not going to all be digging in the same popcorn bowl or, you know, with cheddar cheese or whatever on it. You know, no, no more sharing of that kind, at least for a while. Well, Tom, I've taken up enough of your time. I want to thank you very much for coming on the show. I love your work. I love you. You've been an inspiration of mine for a year, years since I was a kid. And, uh, it, you know, it just means a lot. I have a lot more questions to ask you, but I'm going to wait until we actually get you here on the show when this dickhead known as COVID blows over. So thank you very much for coming on the show. And uh, we'll talk soon. Hope you can find some you know, sound bites, you know, to pull out of all my banter, because for a guy that was a former mine, I talk too fucking much, you know, <laughs> Fine. It's exactly what I want. It's funny because it's like I just want to. I just want you know. I, I want to sit down with you and Mick one day and just have a roundtable discussion just about horror. Just about horror. That's it. I think that would be fun one day. That'd be great. I'd love that. Well, thank you, Tom. Thank you for being on the program. We hope to have you soon. When we come back, we're going to have a frank discussion about frozen peas again, because. Honestly, we don't have any writers. We'll work for money. Stay tuned, guys. We'll be right back.